How's everybody doing? Good. 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 Um, and I'd also like to point out, I just met this lovely couple out in the lobby, Karen and Paul, and they have come all the way from Pike County and Sussex County. So thank you folks for traveling our county today to take part in this program. Karen, unfortunately, has been affected with Lyme, and she is part of the task force for Pike County. So thank you for being here. Dr. Daniel Cameron.
what I am as a, as a doctor treating Lyme for 32 years is that I'm always concerned about how do you even recognize Lyme, how do you know you have Lyme, and how do you tell other people that they have Lyme so they don't have a, a delayed diagnosis. And so when I was in practice uh, in 1990, I've been in practice for three years, I've been taking care of Lyme disease patients, and they described neurologic Lyme, or in other words, Lyme encephalopathy. I knew Lyme encephalopathy um, because I've been taking care of Lyme patients. I was a geriatric doctor, and I know encephalopathy is when the brain doesn't work right. And so this was a package of symptoms that were uh, quite extraordinary, and then I was seeing them, I was giving them in general medicine, and even though there's always talk about does it exist, is it a problem? People at Tufts uh, uh, University uh, said that they, they have these symptoms. Now, when I see a patient, we know a lot more about these symptoms now than we did then. So uh, most of the time when you have Lyme, is the immune system sees something it doesn't like, it doesn't always have to be Lyme, it could be a co-infection. And when that immune system takes off, the adrenaline is really, really high. The cytokines are high, the chemokines are high, so all these chemicals um, give you kind of a fight or flight, but it stays more in the fight mode. And so intense that uh, this recent Hopkins study said that they, these people had at least tenfold higher levels of cytokines than people who were healthy. So it leads to a, a really severe fatigue, debilitating fatigue, fatigue. You can wake up feeling like, I didn't get any sleep, I didn't get anything out of it, and you can have waves of fatigue that come on at two o'clock in the afternoon that's so overwhelming. So everybody on earth has had fatigue, but this is a particular type related to an immune response, and it's very encompassing. The other thing that happens is that every neurotransmitter is turned out. So people tend to have every mood you can think of. So irritability and rage was a, one of the top things they noticed in 1990. But anxiety, sadness, fleeting despair are all things that every emotion you can think of are up. Uh, they're so wired they can't sleep. Often they have head pressure over the forehead or the top of the head. Uh, the neurotransmitters that control sensory system are often elevated, so they often have uh, a heightened sense of smell, of heat, of cold, of light, of night lights, and all kinds of things. They often have um, a autonomic nervous system, which is an automated system that you have, so it's so activated that when they get up to quick, move to quick, they get lightheaded. So that, that orthostatic change is, uh, is more complicated than just the lighthead that showed up on, on those kind of slides. Uh, the other thing is because the, uh, between the sensory, the neurotransmitters that affect the mood, and the autonomic is that they can't process information very fast, so their memory and word finding is impaired, which affects work, affects communication, affects the, the problem when they try to go to school. So, that's why this Lyme encephalopathy was described in 1999. So when I um, look at what they wrote about then in 1999, this memory problems, depression, irritability, somnolence, and headaches makes more sense when you just look at that. If it's all driven by an overreactive immune state, it makes some sense. The memory loss required patients to compensate with new behaviors such as list making, relying on spouses, or making greater efforts to concentrate. But I rely on my spouse all the time, so it's probably not the only, the only criteria. So there's got to be other criteria than that. But Lyme encephalopathy is a term I use a lot of times. Neuropsychiatric presentations, Dr. Fallon took those observations and said it took about two years to get diagnosed, but they often presented with um, paranoid, dementia, schizophrenic, bipolar, these are all the diagnoses that they were given before they got diagnosed with Lyme. Panic attacks, major depression, anorexia nervosa, obsessive compulsive disorders. And so that even the uh, Tufts were noticing that seven out of the 27 had extreme irritability. 
there's something called POTS that wasn't talked about in 1990. That's when you change position. Orthostatics when you set up too quick, move too quick, and those kind of things. Um, so, and then your adrenaline can't respond, so your heart responds, so you get like a tachycardic type problem. So, it's called POTS, positional orthostatic tachycardic. So, this particular study found uh, that in addition to the, the POTS, they often had fatigue, cognitive problems, and orthostatic intolerance. You can get a tilt table, be tilted, see the blood pressure, not respond properly. But there's so much types of autonomic issues that not everybody has to have card, not everybody has just that phenomenon. But the often line is more positional. It's not quite like the nearest disease where you just have to lean a week and you stay in bed and throw up and eventually it passes. There's also at the same time sensory neuropathy. So in addition to that sensory problem that I talked about, they know that sometimes there's nerve damage in the periphery in the legs, and those legs, um, when you take a biopsy, you can find out some damage, and um, that's called sensory neuropathy. But they've also decided that some of them are called CIDP, it's an inflammatory neuropathy, that they use intravenous immune globulin for. I tend to like to do treatment with about first before doing intravenous immune globulin. But it shows you how common this thing, this problem is. Not everybody has a documented damage to their nerve. Then in addition to uh, the cognitive issues that I talked about, what age you are makes a big difference. So in the earlier discussion, Chris Christopherson, we know it was easy to label that as dementia. And so we don't know everything about his case because it was in, uh, in one of the, um, one of the magazines, um, rather than the traditional medical journal, but the fact that after 10 years of being told he had dementia, now um, he's doing well and, 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 uh, and performing is great. But if you're a kid, when you get all these problems, they have things that affect their school. So in this case, in 2008, they wrote that uh, five of the kids developed behavioral problems, forgetfulness, decline in school performance, headaches, fatigue, and two cases of partial complex seizure disorder. So that one sentence says an awful lot about what is gonna to happen to a kid in school where they have all these problems. The first thing is behavioral changes are uh, pretty frustrating if um, you have a kid who wants to have an education and they, they're either irritable, they, have a, they can't focus, they can't concentrate, they have sensory problems, and uh, it, uh, it, the planning school performance is a mess when I see, I see a lot of that. Middle, middle school and high school kids where their plans for college are disrupted, their plans to uh, be in sports, uh, being, in, being athletic uh, is, uh, is impaired and uh, they can be scared. You know, very often doctors will say, well, that must be growing pains. It must be uh, ADHD, it's gotta be uh, something, uh, uh, some other issues. And so it's uh, very important to uh, realize how much it affects that particular age grade, age range uh, in its own particular uh, way. And partial complex seizure disorders is they often don't have <coughs> seizures by EEG, but they have things that kind of look like seizures on the surface, and sometimes they look so strange that they're being told they have a functional problem. Functional is, is a fancy word for it's all in their head, psychiatric. So, you know, as they get to narrow it down, they realize that in kids, there's a group uh, that thought, well, that's immune related, it's from strep, and all you have to do is give some treatment for strep and then do intravenous immune globulins to fight the immune response. So when they went out in the community, they found that in addition to ticks, you know, that facial ticks or body ticks, certain movements, Tourette's, which is verbal things, OCD, that so many other things that look like Lyme, sounds like Lyme, um, every time they had a conference, 80% of the people in the room had a fairly clear history of Lyme or fit Lyme quite well. So, um, so you won't, you often find um, in this, this age range, they, they uh, have a lot of uh, overlap with Lyme. So you'll see some uh, 
doctors uh, not stop at treatment for strep anymore. They'll look at, at Lyme. So that's, that's sort of pending research on that topic. So when I see a patient, um, I look at Lyme, but it's important to, that I also make sure that whether I did it or the doctor right before me, check the thyroid, the blood count, make sure they don't have diabetes or don't say that. They often end up with six doctors before me. The doctors might not mention Lyme, they just say, oh, it's not MS, it's not ALS, it's not thyroid, it's not this and that. Um, and I also check for Lyme and I check for co-infections. Now, just as one of the most well-known blood test uh, is problematic because, first of all, Lyme is a, tends to be a bacteria. And the bacteria has cell walls, cell membranes, cytoplasm, and it's hard to find an exact protein that's on a spirochete of Lyme that's not on the normal bacteria of your body. So when they run the, your blood on that strip that's on, on the far uh, screen, is they try to identify the proteins that are unique to Lyme, but it's very hard to find proteins unique to Lyme. So that's why you'll see something called the Western blot, where they put all these blots on there and try to line it up and see if you get uh, bands. So the CDC in 1994 decided that you should have five out of 10 bands, which are representative of certain proteins, um, or two out of three IgM. M is the first responders, G is the, is the second responder. So because we're so dependent on the immune system, we just don't get a nice, clean, positive test for half the time. And so that's why people get four bands, two bands, three bands. Also some important bands like the 31, 34 on the bottom are, um, they decided that those are important, but they didn't include them in the definition because they figured everybody was going to get a vaccine, everybody's going to get a 31, 34 for the vaccine. In real life, hardly anybody's ever had the vaccine. So you're going to find that that's why you always hear the tests are so disappointing. And when they when doctors say, I don't want to do anything unless the Western blot is positive, you, know, you, have, you have a sinking feeling because they don't look a second time to lie. They don't use chemical judgment. Um, and, and I think that's important. So when I get ready to treat somebody, I, I try to make sure that I use clinical judgment to make sure it's nothing else, also to, uh, to make sure I don't rely totally on the test. But there's a bunch of reasons why Lyme is tough, and so they keep, over the last 30 years, keep looking at it. One reason is that, that uh, there's demyelination, of, that some of the coating of the nerves is damaged, it's sanctuary, it means it's hiding in the brain sometimes with some tissues that uh, sometimes you don't know which antibiotic works worse because you'll see one person where doxycycline works well, the next person it doesn't work well. There's different clones, that is different types of proteins. How they, the outer surface protein C, there's, there's some severe strains, medium strains, and mild strains. Uh, there's, uh, there's some genes that keep changing the proteins. The proteins keep changing and changing and changing and the body keeps trying to keep up with the changing, how the gene expresses itself. Yeah, each person has their own immune system that you developed over time. The immune activation, the whole immune system is involved, like the adrenaline effect. Sometimes they might be in the cell, they might be biofilms. Now biofilms are tricky because Problems exist in staph infections, strep infections, but not so clear cut in Lyme, because Lyme doesn't tend to break down tissue. So they, they know spirochetes love biofilm in the testing, but they're trying to find it in, in people, so they're, they're studying the leaves. They're also studying the cysts. The cysts occur in the test tube, but do they occur in people? So that's why I, I read heavily on biofilms and cysts and all these other mechanisms looking for a clue as to how do I get a patient better. <coughs> so what I usually do um, is I have some oral antibiotics, more than one choice. I have intravenous and intramuscular. I don't really use intravenous except for my backup. Um, 
I go longer, I go higher dose sometimes, I treat for co-infections at the same time. Uh, sometimes sequential means doxycycline might not work now, but later on when I treat for Babesia, perhaps doxycycline might work then. And uh, so, but, you know, there's a, there's all kinds of like uh, thoughts that are floating out there, but I always say, well, everybody's different in how much antibiotics they've had. So I have plenty of people who haven't really had much of anything. And so uh, this is where I start. Now, if I already have somebody who comes in and say that I've had everything, then I got to go through this and say, well, what does everything mean? I'm not a big fan of pulse therapy where you do, you know, weekend treatments and then you do something moving around. So I don't think that I'd rather just stay more consistent. That, but other doctors like pulse. Um, but this is from the perspective if I get somebody that that's new or they haven't been methodically looked at is, is um, I, I look at the organism on the left side, like Lyme. Ehrlichia, they changed one of the Ehrlichian pathogens to call it anaplasmosis now, Babesia um, and Bartonella. And so um, you see that there's no one antibiotic that takes care of everything. So I'll often use doxycycline as a start because um, it takes care of Lyme, Ehrlichia, anaplasmosis, and Bartonella, but it won't do anything for Babesia. If they're allergic, I can't use amoxicillin anyway, um, unless I do a skin test. If they, have, if they want to do intravenous, that's in the, um, in the amoxicillin family, but intravenous doesn't take care of uh, Ehrlichia, anaplasmosis, Babesia, or Bartonella. So that I'm always trying to figure out what could be your tip, because I got a positive test for one bug, but what happens if the real infection is, is the one I'm not testing for? So let me go back to that slide again. So that's why I, instead of doxycycline alone, I, I sometimes use amoxicillin as my backup after I've tried doxycycline, and I might use Zithromax or Vaxin. Um, but in any case, no matter what I do, is um, Babesia is a parasite that I can't treat with doxycycline amoxicillin or zithromax. I gotta do something for a parasite called Babesia, and that's where instead of nepron as a liquid, I'll often use maron as a pill. A pill is a, it's a lower dose, but it's certainly, it's in a pill form and easy to take. So um, no matter what I do, I wanna make sure that they at least had an organized approach to the infection um, <coughs> instead of, um, you know, off in another direction. I also try to avoid alcohol and sugar. I, I do a lot of counseling because when people come in with pediatric issues, adolescent issues, geriatric issues, it's just so much uncertainty because they've already been told by 10 doctors that, that it's not mine or they've been told by their spouses that that it's not Lyme, or they, they uh, and there's this uh, immune response that's so intense and so strong that they themselves have ups and downs. Of it, but they might get worse when they start, called a Rixheimer reaction. They might have um, ups and downs. Some people get better pretty quickly, and some it's a long-term process. So I have to do a lot of counseling. I don't do alternative medicine so much. Uh, I, I leave that to some alternative medicine with that precious time that I have with somebody in the exam room, I engage them in what they're doing with work or with home or family or school or emotionally or a lot of things and because it's a it's like a little bit like cognitive behavioral therapy, how to get them moving, how to get them active, how to get engaged, what's happening. Especially if they're slow going, it's how do you keep the courage up to fight an infection. And how do you manage, uh, then have to manage pain, sleep, fatigue. Pain is pretty hard to manage, because it's in, there's all this discussion of uh, narcotics. The narcotics are, aren't that helpful for this kind of illness anyway, but pain is so intense that some people are going to ketamine, intravenous ketamine now for pain, and they'll go to ketamine first, and then they'll realize when they're at the ketamine clinic and they get confusion with ketamine is that, Oh, that's right, I have a 
so many other issues besides pain that maybe I should go and talk to uh, somebody that works with ticks and works with Lyme in case the ketamine is, is not going to solve it. So um, I don't really work with cysts and biofilms directly. Um, um, a lot of people are, are hoping that something in the alternative medicine might help, um, but it's still a looking for some kind of solutions. Uh, I don't use complementary alternative directly because I do so much with counseling and other kinds of work that I leave it to the alternative medicine in their neighborhood. The people travel quite a ways to see me. So I wanted to go to it, part two and then part three. Part two is, uh, because I've been around a long time, I've been trying to not only do what I do in my practice, but speak up and try to get the, some other doctors to at least uh, um, have the flexibility to treat. So with evidence-based medicine, that seemed natural because I'm an epidemiologist trained at the University of Minnesota in epidemiology and you can study uh, the, the literature a lot better. So evidence-based medicine is the best research evidence with clinical expertise and patient value. So a lot of doctors forget the second two parts. All they do is look at clinical trials. So uh, I was the first author with uh, ILADS, the International Lyme Associated Disease Society, looking at what does the evidence say. So the evidence is, is, is quite different in how it's interpreted. The Infectious Disease Society of America said chronic Lyme is it's not clear that it exists as a, as a distinct entity. It's not. Uh, they're not really sick, uh, they have very limited scope of treatment, and um, the guidelines I work with it said the evidence is not, it, it doesn't come to that conclusion. So that's like physician papers and trying to allow doctors to uh, do something. Now, the IDSA has three um, guidelines that I wanted to point out that, uh, that I disagree with and I like to disagree with. One is that a single dose of doxycycline following a tick bite is effective, 10 to 21 days is effective, and no retreatment unless you have Lyme arthritis. So we disagree strongly on those, and so I want to give examples of the kind of data it takes to, to argue these rather simple points. So for a 200 milligram doxycycline dose, that was based on one study, and those who've got the uh, 200 milligrams of doxycycline, there was only one rash in that group, about 250 people. In those who got placebo, there were eight rashes. So they were able to cut down most of the rashes, but the, the problem that we saw in ILADS is that they didn't study anybody more than six weeks. So how do you know if they've been any of the neurologic line, sensory line, POTS, uh, any of the autonomic issues, and so it's uh, you couldn't trust two doxycycline pills as a single dose for a tick bite. Um, when we look at clearing rashes, most rashes clear whether you treat them or not. So if you look a year later, um, whether you took doxycycline, moxicillin, zithromax, or septin, the long-term failure rate was uh, in the 33 to 36, and et cetera. Some of that was um, clear symptoms, some was um, Loss to follow up, and so it's a, you know, it's in epidemiology, it's a sort of a mixture. It's like uh, intent to treat. So we were not very happy with the in, in, with the outcomes, even with the, with with the treatment of early Lyme. Then the NIH came in and said, "Well, we look at more of the chronic, long-term manifestations of Lyme, but the sample size is." Were not very impressive. You know, usually you hear, you know, people taking hypertensive drugs where there's 10,000 people involved in the study, cardiovascular studies, there's thousands. This one, all I could come up with the sample size of 70 was the biggest study of its sponsor by the NIH uh, in the Klempner trial, and the smallest was 37 patients by Fallon at Columbia. And so, they were supposed to get a little higher, like 194, all they got was 70. So this is uh, um, looking at, um, at uh, pretty, uh, pretty dismal numbers, not much to work with. Also, the people that 
that sign up for these NIH-sponsored trials meant well, but who wants to sign up for one where you get a placebo? So if you get a placebo and you're that sick for that long, is that uh, they, they're not as inclined to, to enroll. So they enroll people who uh, met well, but they were sick for 4.7 years in the Fentanyl trial, uh, nine years in the Fallon trial, and they had already failed treatment already. So they only took people who had failed treatment and were sick that long. So, and they were using kind of this quality of life scale. So if you look at the general population, it's 50, you normalize, so an average person <coughs> off the street would be 50, 52, 53. So diabetes would be 42, cancer would be 41. The Fallon trial was um, 37, which is pretty bad. And the Klettner studies were 32, and the Norwegian study by, by Brenda was uh, 31 to 32, so we're, a lot of patients, their quality of life is pretty crappy, and, um, and especially the ones that enrolled in trials because they're, they've been sick for so long. So Brenda in, in Norway, in a Norwegian study, they looked at you know two weeks of IV cetraxone, which is the, the orange bar. Then they did one where they followed up with um, the black bar with biaxin and plaquenil, and then the, the blue bar with doxycycline. So you see the quality of life at, at zero weeks was, you know, 30, 32. And at the end of uh, 50 weeks a year later, they're sitting at um, still not normal. So that's why they gained three points on a, on a <coughs> physical PCS type scale. and. Um, 15 points below the general population. So when they said, oh, it didn't help to study and another, add another 10 weeks of treatment, I said, I don't think they really got to the bottom of the illness in the first place. If they're crappy in the beginning, they're crappy at the end, and three points, we'll take what we can get. But the, they, they, I don't think they got a trial that showed, uh, uh, showed much. And what they said in the study is, oh, treatment doesn't help, so don't treat. Um, if one looks at the NIH trials, is that the fatigue actually got quite a bit better in the CRUP study. 64% of the treatment got better. The 18% of the placebo group got better. And the Fallon study is 66 versus 25, so actually those were quite good. The quality of life, which is sort of just generally how you're feeling, is pretty hard to have somebody been sick for nine years to say, oh, well, now your quality of life is going to get all better in, in, a, in a few weeks. And so sometimes you run into, well, your expectations. And anybody that beat up that long, it takes longer to get the quality of life better, especially with the ups and downs. And the, the cognitive function, did, with the buck goes into how your brain works. That is on the next. So the other thing that came up that we didn't like, and I like this, they decided to call it, anybody sick, call it post-treatment. Lyme disease syndrome, which is they've been treated, usually three weeks of doxycycline. Now it's a syndrome, it's not an infection. So there's no test to say that the infection's gone, that the persistent infection's gone, or any of that kind of stuff. They just decided it's post treatment Lyme disease syndrome. So you're getting a lot of research papers where the doctor accepts PTLDS. It says, well, they're sick, and they've been sure able to show they're sick by MRIs of the brain, by memory, by every other function. And so, um, IDIS has been opposed to the use of that term. You know, it's, and, you know they're sick. They, why don't I call it a syndrome and flip it over so quickly? So, uh, the third, moving into the third and last part of my, my presentation is that um, I published this paper in 2006 uh, looking at people who had Lyme disease and um, who had five IgG bands. I mean, they had what the CDC said would be the right number of bands to cause Lyme disease. The ELISA was positive also. And I was looking at those who had treatment delay, delays. And so case one was sick for uh, 20, almost 3,000 a day, 35-year-old uh, man who had erythema migraine rash, but they, they chose to, to test uh, one week after the rash and rely on a test rather than just treat for a, a rather simple case, but they missed it. 
But if you go down, you'll see that the, the top eight was somebody had Epstein Barr and Strep. They didn't uh, look beyond that. They just probably blamed it on chronic fatigue. The, the third one was a tick bite followed by a swollen knee. But instead of saying it was synovitis, which is that swelling of the knee that showed up in the first talk, they called it a meniscal tear. The next was Bell's palsy. Um, they probably assumed it was a virus rather than, than Lyme. They did poor in school. The fifth was a six by six inch rash that just, they never realized the significance of it. Next is typical <coughs> symptoms, but it was told it wasn't Lyme by two doctors. There's always this expression I use that doctors often talk to you saying that there's two things you can count on in life. You have death, taxes, and you don't have Lyme. So it's when you get told by two doctors to your face that you don't have Lyme, it's sort of intimidating. Uh, the next was Bell's palsy, told not Lyme because the spinal tap was negative. The spinal tap is positive only about 10% of the time in the, in the original series. And the last one is the sinusitis, so two sinus surgeries before they realized that they should look at Lyme. Because Lyme has a lot of pressure here. So, when you look at all the different diagnoses, they, they weren't exotic diagnoses. The doctors were saying it was that, oh no, you have fatigue, poor concentration. This is from the problem list. And, no, you have sleep disturbance, aches, water, knee, arthritis, sinusitis, migraine, rotator cuff, rash, Bell's palsy, cellulitis. Cellulitis is an infection of the skin. What do you say? I can't be lying. It must be an infection of the skin. Fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue, and Epstein Barr. So they're not like exotic diagnoses. That the things that doctors see and they just miss the, miss the opportunity to treat. So um, looking at doctors, you know, trying to get doctors and to take on Lyme, there's this study of how people think, how doctors think. Um, there's 2.5% of the people are innovators. Um, early adopters is 13.5, but there's all these laggards over on the other end. So, uh, who don't really change that fast. And so um, I've always considered that, uh, that all the IDLADS guidelines, the society guidelines, all that stuff is helpful to argue with the laggards. If I call them laggards, I'm just using this as, as for argument's sake. So what happens is that since they don't budge much, I've been shifting what I do lately to working with the innovators and early adopters rather than just kind of bump my head up against the laggards. <clears throat> so there is evidence that some doctors are changing because this study of, uh, in 2015 showed that there were 60 people like myself who treat quite a quite lot of Lyme, but there were foreign, the rest of them were all you know, treated in a few cases. It was interesting of all these uh, cases, all these providers that if you treat it, they were treating um, with a similar number of antibiotics, a similar number of refills, a similar amount of multiple antibiotics. And so the data is showing that there are some doctors out there that are treating in the Northeast past the 16 or so who do a lot of work in the area. So back to the, this is a chart that says that if the innovators and then get a few early adopters and early majority, you know, from that, belt, that blue bell-shaped curve is that all of a sudden uh, that yellow line, it picks up momentum and more and more people will get involved in line and treat line and shit. H. pylorus for stomach ulcers took a while before people rapidly started adopting that as an alternative to surgical procedures on ulcers. So the question is, can you get more innovators early adopters? This also could apply to uh, patients and community leaders is that not everybody is uh, on board with looking for Lyme and helping with Lyme. Everybody here in this room is, uh, is uh, looking carefully, but there's some people in the community are, are, are going to reluctant to do anything with Lyme. So what I've been doing is instead of working only with uh, ILADS and, and writing guidelines is writing science blogs. So on my own um, website, Daniel Cameron MD, I've uh, passed 300 science blogs, which means when I read an article, review an article, I'll review what I learned from that article and publish it in the, on my website, and I'll 
post that on, my, on Facebook saying it, it's ready, it's set, this is what I've read. So these are some examples of things that I could do. So um, there's something called point of care, which is when someone um, is taking care of a patient or someone sees a patient or someone has a family member who's sick, that's the moment you need to know about mine. You don't really always know too much until it's important to you. So I'm trying to you know, have 300 different, I have 300 so far where someone Googles and looks up, well, well uh, what's the antibi best antibiotic to treat really a Miyamoto? Well, sometimes it's hard to go find a research article of PubMed, and this kind of article says, well, this is like, you know, 400, 500 words on the subject, and where does the article come from, and what, do, what does the research article say to me, and that kind of thing. So that's why um, it's, I'm building a database of articles that I've read that I can review and put in posts so people can read it when it's important to them. Also, the way the internet works is that people can share articles. So if they're concerned about being multi, they just push some share button from my website, and someone can read it, re read that type of thing. So um, this was an article that just came out about a month ago that said, let's look at all the emergency rooms when the parents are there, the kid's there, they have a rash, they got CDC criteria for Lyme, is uh, how many of them remember a rash? Not, sorry, not, how many remember a tick bite? So less than 19% remembered it seeing a tick bite. So these are like six emergency rooms. It shows you how seldom does a child with the parents there remember such things. So this is just the only minority of children. This was a 24-year-old army officer, this was about a month ago, who had got treated for Lyme, had some procedures on his, uh, on his extremities, eventually could never get his health back and had to leave the military service. And so they had talked about that it's a shame for, for, for him personally, but it's also a shame that it costs 200000 to train each military person to get ready to work, and now he's uh, out of commission when he's at his peak of training and peak of everything. This was a study found that in the Burley Miyamoto, I should mention Burley Miyamoto is a uh, pathogen harbored in the same tick. So you always hear about Lyme, Ehrlichia, Anaplasmosis, Rubesia. Well, this is a new bug. It's, they've been studying it for years. They just said, no, it caused disease. So in, J in Japan, they said, oh, well, this is the disease it causes. This is how sick you are. This is what, what you can expect. So that's why it has a Japanese sounding name. And so they, they dusted off the research from America saying, well, oh, that is a disease. So that's called Borrelia Miyamoto. But we always tend to blame the nymphs and adults for all the disease. Well, somehow the Miyamoto gets carried from the adult to the eggs into the larva. So the larva that are even smaller than nymphs can get you and, 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 and can give you really Miyamoto that can cause disease. Now, we don't know a lot about the disease yet, not enough, as to how many chronic issues are related to it. This is our Lone Star ticks in your neighborhood, so that even though we always think, oh, well, that's a Lone Star state, we forget about it, we're okay, we're safe here. But this study showed how many Lone Stars there are in the Northeast. Autonomic dysfunction. This is where, remember I said they're studying better what's going on with the immune system related to Lyme. This is a nice paper on all autonomic dysfunction, small fiber neuropathy, and so one can if, you're, if your kid has this problem or you're preparing for it and showed up with a search, at least you know the article to go to and I can start a discussion dialogue. Tourists visiting the United States contract with Bezia leaving one dead. So when you, um, two people left from the Northeast went to uh, uh, overseas and uh, got work, I think it was uh, maybe in Korea. And then uh, one made it, one didn't, but they, uh, they both got Babesia. Now, one thing about Babesia is that we always think everything happens at once. So in, a, in that book that I, that I have that's out there, in the, the last six cases, um, there were two women that, that were pregnant, had uh, Lyme, 
as evidenced by a rash, got treated for the Lyme, had healthy babies, the babies went on home, went home. But on the return visit, the two babies had babesia in their bloodstreams. The, the red cells were full of uh, the, the parasites. And so, you know, and that was, I thought, two good examples of not everything occurs at once. So sometimes you get sick from Lyme, then pop up later on with, oh, another manifestation line. So maybe why some people get a relapse and not a relapse, it may be that the disease didn't pop up until later. So these didn't pop up until after they got uh, left the United States. Don't confuse somatic symptoms with depression. So uh, Dr. Gary Worms, who you know, did the IDSA guidelines, where they do a lot of questionnaires, found that most of the people who had depression by the questionnaires, the depression would go away when they treated the Lyme. So his warning was, just because they had a lot of somatic symptoms, they had a lot of the depressive type moods, is that, that that seemed to come with the Lyme. If you treat the Lyme, that takes care of it. The Yale study says, kids don't have Lyme, they have medically unexplained symptoms. So he's a epidemiologist like I am, but we don't always come to the same conclusion. He's at Yale and he says, the medical unexplained MUS is it means, yes, there's a problem, but we don't know what it is and you can go home now. So they're doing research on that. And so, you know, the definition is similar to Lyme definition. So I was just including his thoughts on that particular respect, how he sees the world as not Lyme, but a medical unexplained symptom. Where is the FDA test for relapsing fever spirochetes? So that shows uh, how little research we have on it because there wasn't much leadership on that, on that, with that organism. Relying on negative tests uh, can prove deadly. This was, uh, you know, there was some discussion in the first presentation about Watson virus. So they got excited at this uh, place in Poughkeepsie in New York, saying this kid who uh, was going to Brown went to this camp preparing for Brown, came back sick, and they said, oh, you're sick, it must be a tick-borne thing, it must be Blossom. So they were waiting for the Blossom test to come in, waiting for it to come in, waiting for it to come in, then he died in the backyard. So um, they, when they did an autopsy, which was published in a journal, um, they didn't find any evidence of Blossom at all, but they found all the organs, or quite a few of the organs were teeming with Lyme disease. And so this case is that, you know, I've always argued that if you're thinking of a tick board, and don't forget to at least look at well, what could be a tick. That just because you're focused on blossom, awesome, could it be something else? And so you always wonder in hindsight if they had taken back cycling, at the very least, that might have um, uh, prevented a, a, a poor outcome. So, you know, when I since I, I, the first 150 of my science-based blogs I put in this book, that's the book that's out there. Um, so I'm exploring, um, it, I call it the inside line, uh, an expert's guide to the science of Lyme disease. So I'm trying to guide people into what I read in the literature and how to, uh, how to translate it. So instead of working with a laggard type uh, battle of the type of what we could call battle of the titans, um, um, why not do it this way? So what I've done also is that um, instead of more of a static on my website, um, that side, I decided why not uh, bone up on uh, how to make videos. So I've been making videos and posting them on uh, Facebook and on Instagram. My daughter um, was the one who said, well, why don't you do Instagram? Because uh, that's, that's it. That's where the youth are and that's where she is. And, and uh, I'm not the youth, but it, but it doesn't mean I can't dust off my youth tires and try it. So I've been able to make, uh, I put out about 100 videos so far, all one main formats on topics that I've seen in my practice. So this is a video I've made on, on I have Lyme disease, please don't give, give up on me. So it explores a topic of where a child might feel when they've seen a doctor and doctor says, oh, there's two things you can, you can count on a lot of death taxes and, and you don't have it. It's growing pains. And, or the frustrations where 
mom and dad disagree, grandpa's has a different opinion, this and that, and so, um, and, and even, even if everybody's deported, it can be pretty tough on a child. So in one minute, I can capture that thought, and people can share that video with someone else and say, hey, you know, you're not alone. Or even the kid can handle one minute. Their, their patience is, it's still within the one, one minute. They don't have much more patience than that sometimes. Um, a lot of the hypersensitivity of the, of the sensory system is elevated. So in this case, um, sound sensitivity is uh, a video. Uh, a tsunami of symptoms of Lyme disease. Symptoms sometimes come on in waves. The, the adrenaline, the fight or flight, the autonomic nervous system comes on so fast at two in the afternoon or at odd times it comes on after sugar, sometimes after stress, after being up too late. Um, so it comes on so quick, I, I just thought a tsunami seems appropriate. Because the tsunami, what I see on TV is that if you're there 10 minutes later, it doesn't look that bad, it looks very peaceful, it's usually sunny after a tsunami hits the beach. And you're busy as a family trying to collect all the chaos that just happened to everybody in the family when they had rage or something else. Frustrations in the family of the Lyme disease patient. And not everybody agrees, and it can be, and, and, and plus it can be a long-term process. So you want to make sure that, that, uh, that during that, I hear you that conversations during the exam, and try to work through uh, how hard it is to have different opinions. And the child can change all the time also. Difficulty recognizing Lyme in children. It's so easy to call it something else. Um, you know, it might take a long time before you realize, oh, I didn't even notice it, but I on my nose and I didn't see it. I didn't recognize it. I didn't, uh, never thought of it that way, and that kind of thing. Feet pain. There's uh, lots of people um, have feet pain um, who have Lyme. And so they get told, you know, it's uh, you have a uh, heel spur or you have plantar fasciitis. But since that's really common with Lyme, probably is not fully understood. It may be that nerve, nerve pain type issue. It could be something, something else. Um, this one is um, by Bransfield, who's been a whole career doing psychiatric uh, Lyme. He wrote that Lyme is and associated diseases contribute to causing suicidal tendencies, suicide uh, and combined suicidal and homicidal tendencies in individuals who did not show these tendencies before being infected. So I was happy he's taking some time on his career to capture a lot of the, it doesn't mean suicide, but suicidal <coughs> ideation, suicidal thoughts, and despair. A lot of people are pleading despair. That you know, I talk to them about suicide, but it's not exactly that either, but it's certainly pretty intense. Problems between siblings. Not everybody in the family is always on the same page, and I'm surprised how siblings do fairly well, but it can still be complicated. Profound flare-ups of symptoms. So you can come back and be so um, intense, or you can have parts of the day, you have a week or three, and you go to and bam. Hope is important, so I try to, instead of like um, saying, oh, well, you're doomed, is that it's easy to feel doomed at times, but how do you work through it? I would like to call counseling, it's part of that visit to try to capture what can I work with to get that hope back. Like this post-treatment Lyme disease syndrome is that it seems like about 10% of people in uh, recent studies, at least 10% of people treated for Lyme, even at the rash phase, get post-treatment Lyme disease syndrome. Um, and they're pretty sick, whether you look at it from fatigue, how their brain works, pain, or function. They don't even call it post-treatment Lyme disease syndrome unless you've lost some function. And there are plenty of people who have Lyme who function, not because they, they it's easy, but they still, they, they truck, they truck along because their parents, or they hold their job, but nothing else holds them on, but they hold that job, you know, and try to have them hold on to the job. And so it's the only thing they can, they can have to do it for a while. And a kid, you'd be surprised how many kids if they, if you counsel them and work with them, will hold on to their grades desperately, no matter how sick they are, and they'll hold on so tight to that that dream that when they get better, then they can get back on the college track and that, those kind of things. 
This was a 31-year-old woman in severe pain from post-treatment Lyme disease syndrome where they were giving intravenous ketamine to it. It had some value for pain, but there was no mention in the article that, that what about the concentration problems, the cognitive problems, the fatigue, and other issues. And so there, it was shows how they focus on one part of the issue. <coughs> Teens with Lyme disease should speak up. So this is, um, you know, trying to get teens themselves uh, using the social media, using this kind of one minute format where you share with them that um, how can they share, speak up, right? how can they articulate that they're having a problem. Sick and tired of being sick and tired with Lyme disease. You've heard that expression before? Yeah, so I actually found out when I was writing that one minute video that actually came from someone in the South who a black woman activist who was had every problem you could imagine, including, um, I think, a kid being taken. I had this kind of abortion you have in the South where they just take the, the womb out, that kind of thing. And so, but she was sick about being sick and tired. She adopted kids and had a, had a build of life. But she, she's been, they said that, she kind of captured that expression. But I think it, it works pretty well for Lyme patients. Little data for big decisions on Lyme disease. So, um, I was talking about the NIH trials, and you have 70 people, 37 people, and that's all you got, and people are picked over, so that, you know, there's some efforts to try to get the big data at some point, so that's why um, out on the table out there, there's, um, there's a, for example, it's a good example, that the Bay, uh, <coughs> Bay Area Lyme Disease Coalition uh, with the Cohen Foundation has reached out and is working with the with a, a gentleman here, even, and they, they already reached out to me also. What they're looking for is um, is how to do big data. So they have a big data thing, database of patients' data. It's called uh, uh, Lyme Disease or My Lyme Data Project has uh, 12,000 patients' data in there, so they're finding some conclusions. But what on the table is talking about collecting tissue ahead of time, because you can't collect tissue after the fact that it, it doesn't uh, hold up, but you can compare the tissue banks and, and work with big data to try to like get get some developments, and, and it's nice that they're, they're reaching out to the, the, to the local level. So this one is attacks and recurrences of Lyme disease, so sometimes it seems like, you know, people feel like they're kind of going nowhere fast, and it's a little bit like a Kia commercial. Um, this is, is Lyme disease cure futile? So I have people who come into my office thinking that it's futile, that's it, I'm not going to get better, I'm never going to get better, uh, that, that kind of stuff. And so it captures that thought. Personalized Lyme disease treatment. No one size fits all. So I'm pushing, trying to push for second opinions because not all doctors have the same opinion. I'm also looking at uh, personalized care with my own patients. How do I, what goes into the process of what, how I think, how I process. So sometimes this video series and the science blogs gets me to think too, how I've been trained and how I think. So what happens is that I'm trying, that's why the inside mind, the book on the left is out there. Um, I have about, you know, I have the uh, nearly 300 of those uh, scripts. I have about 100 put out, but I have 300 scripts for videos. So I might, um, I'm, th I'm putting those together in a book, and I'll call it, the in I think I'll call it the Inside Lyme and Experts View. Uh, and I'm thinking um, that, that as a proposal is so many of the cases that I, so many of the cases that are in that book out there and a bunch of other cases are actually cases where some people like the land just by looking at cases alone. A lot of people experience. I like cases from literature because some they've been well vetted. They've been people are out there. They, they say, oh yeah, you know. And you already have people in your own sphere who are cases. But it's nice from a medical perspective to read what's been published. So what this is is that um, I always call it the in, inside line conversation. Is that every time I put out a blog. Um, I, I announce it so there's endless amount of um, 
comments by readers. So I put out a video that you know, it can be anywhere from 30 to 100 uh, plus uh, responses. So part of what I do is, is what I produce. Let's say it take one minute to produce it, then you have that 30 to 50 to 100 comments that one can read, hearing what other people's thoughts and how they respond to those things. And so that's a building process, but it's, it makes it much more interactive to, uh, to work with it. So if, if I were to summarize what I've done today, is I wanted to talk about and share with you what I see in my practice that is a, uh, that's sort of a really intense, but it's often related to the whole immune response to a, to a tick. And there's a lot of similarities between the bees, the every day, but it does more than you think, and how the immune system responds. The second part was how um, I spent years uh, fighting uh, the idea of, say, trying to argue position papers so doctors can say, well, I'm following the eyelid treatment guidelines, or I have evidence-based medicine for what I do, and so when somebody's ready, they have something to cite. And then uh, this third part was that I uh, exploring um, how to uh, avoid treatment delays, how to avoid uh, confusion out there, and if one can communicate directly with the social media platforms with videos and book and other things to uh, or uh, for people who are relatively lost out there. And, and, could you, and even if they, they have their doctors, it doesn't mean they can't dwell and spend a little time on examining issues, sharing them with others, so they can, uh, they can start a conversation. So I, I appreciate the, the opportunity to come up and bring up the data as to where I'm at uh, in my practice and where I'm at with uh, my projects. Thank you much for bringing me up. I think there'll be some time for, uh, that was 12.30. We have time, we have plenty of time for questions. Yes, we do. Yeah, so we're in good shape. So what kind of questions or thoughts? Uh, is, uh, I covered a lot of ground, but the first speaker covered a lot of the basics the, of the disease, of, of prevention, of uh, a lot, so I could just kind of, it freed me up to be able to just expand into other topics. So, sir? Yeah. I'm wondering if there's any information about the, the uh, presence of these various organisms in the circulating blood at different stages of the disease process. The, the question is, is, is there information about the presence of the organism and circ what's it happening and how is it circulated? There's not much known in, um, in we had very to culture and grow anything in, uh, in any of the tick-borne illnesses. The, the closest they get is if you culture at the edge of a lime rash, you can grow the organism, but you can't grow at the rest of the tissues very often. The BZ is probably the closest, because the BZ, the first week or two, it can be all over your body and into the red cells, and you can see it under the microscope. Um, but then it first disappears, and it often happens with BZ, you can't see a thing, you can't find any evidence by blood test, and the only reason you know it is that, it, that they donate the blood, because you feel good, you don't see it, and then the recipient ends up with blood, like the, the neonatal intensive care units, those two kids that went home. There was somebody in um, at Yale that was writing in a journal about some kid in the NICU that was, um, uh, had babesia, and then they found out that there were two other people who, um, two other newborn neon, in the neonatal intensive care unit had babesia, and so they found out that uh, some 20-some-year-old boy had donated the blood and had known he was sick, and then they, so three of the kids in the, in the unit got it, even though there was no evidence. So it just shows that more of how rare you can see um, anything in the body. In the body. That's why the tissue bearing study that I talked about still has challenges on the development and you can't actually find the tissues. So what we're trying to do is, is develop some new techniques, perhaps that you may be able to find in the future with these tissues, with new techniques, since we can't find it right now. In fact, that's why if you can't find it in these tissues, they always say it must not be there if you can't see it in the tissue. 
So they need to know you're fine. If we didn't see it, your chest is normal. That's it. What advice would you give for a patient who has
this is a blind itself. But since a lot of dirt of people have the BZ at the same time, is that even if you treat that to cyclone, you're still going to miss some people. So that I think that I always tell people that even if you treat early with a rash and doing well, is just be aware that two thirds are doing well, but one out of three has some issues. Could it be the BZ? Could it be that they have to go online longer? I think they should. Um, the, Advocates of post treatment Lyme disease syndrome, they call it untreatable. That you shouldn't be treating those people. So that this week in Newsweek, there was an article that was, came out that said that, that if 10% if of people had post treatment Lyme disease syndrome, which is where the data is going, and that means they have poor function. And over a, a few years, there'll be at least a billion dollars in and uh, cost associated with just leaving them ill. So I always uh, think that the, I wouldn't give up so quick on, on, and call it a syndrome. <coughs> I wouldn't give up on um, if, if you're doing well, just be aware that it could come back, might not. Because it's so intense, that's why people tend to worry about relapses and they know it's fairly common. It's so visual anyway, that's why. It's sort of a natural intuitive that if you've been that sick for that long and you get better, you always wonder what it's going to be for the future. Is that good? Yeah. How useful is MRI in determining if you have Lyme or not? Uh, MRI is uh, not very useful um, as a tool to uh, whether you have Lyme disease. It's, um, there was a, a time where if you had white spots or demyelination in the brain, you would call it Lyme. But then if you went to neurologist, they would call it multiple sclerosis. If you went to a headache person, migraines, and then psychiatrists would say that, no, oh, that's from uh, depression. So even white spots have uh, lost their ability to tell you if you have Lyme disease. Spec scan is the same way. They're abnormal, which is kind of a nuclear study. But they're abnormal in almost the same way in Lyme as anything else. Um, when you hear a PET scan that's abnormal from Alzheimer's, often the same abnormalities in the PET scan are um, showing up uh, in Lyme. That's a si similar pet patterns. I, I didn't look at a paper to see how close, but there, there's a lot of similarities. Even Dr. Fallon at Columbia was doing some studies because his grant was big enough to do expensive PET scans, and he says they were kind of showing the same thing as a spec scan. So if I'm hearing from you correctly, <coughs> you you believe from your practice that um, diagnostic techniques right now are probably better or more, um, if done by somebody like yourself, are better or more complete than testing techniques at this time. In other words, if you went down through, say, the five diseases that you've talked about, approximately five how many of them do you really trust a blood test or some other test like that? And obviously I know that you seem to indicate that diagnostic techniques to you are, are very important. Are there really good well, testing? Uh, the question is, are there really good testing that can beat the doctor's experience of mine? Um, no. The, um, there, you know, Maybe a third of the time or half the time you can get some tests that are helpful, so I always do them anyway, because half the time it could be some reassurance that I have supportive tests and it gives some value. Uh, the other half I don't really have anything, and so that's why I spend most of my, my talk on clinical judgment. Not everybody picks clinical judgment. And clinical judgments, part of it is what it looks like, that's why I describe it in such detail. And the other is, Clinical judgment involves making sure it's not multiple sclerosis or fibromyalgia. But even fibromyalgia is tricky because fibromyalgia and Lyme look alike. So it's a, it's a mat. And, and, and lastly is that I stick with that person in, until they get better. So that means is that I have the opportunity to add specialists as I go along. If I think they, you know, like I had somebody this week who, he was reminding me that that is parathyroids, which are under the thyroids, so that he had to get removed. He said um, that 
he reminded me that I told him that he should go to necrologist and get that looked at because uh, I said, well, that isn't exactly the right match. Just make sure you get that looked at. He got it off, and that helped it helped the, the story. But, he, I, but I, I think follow-up is a way to clean up a lot of the things that I'm facing. I always have the option of retreating or, or I mean, revisiting <coughs> how, how far they go with work at. Should they go to the third neurologist? And if they go to a third neurologist, what should they look for? If they go to a cardiologist, should they get a tilt table? Uh, those kind of things. Should they go to ketamine for pain? So kind of a follow-up to that. Um, when you say line, are you talking about all the five or multiple diseases that you've talked about? Under that, it sounds like you are because they're tick-borne diseases. Yes, I, I, when I say Lyme disease, I typically use it as an umbrella term. Right. And so, but it'd be pretty, uh, as a, a, otherwise, because if I have to rattle off the six terms or seven terms or eight terms each time, it gets to, um, it, it doesn't go well uh, when I talk. And so I think right. of it as a, as a, as a broad term. The other thing is that um, there's always kinds of, um, commonalities between a lot of the tick. There's, there's more commonality things than you might think on how it does the immune response. Part of it is that the tick harbors the same spirogate. So the spirogate has to survive in, in, in an egg form, in a larva form, then it has to survive in a, in a mouse, then it has to survive in a human. So it, it, there's certain things that are probably not going to make it. So they, they um, and probably why it's all driven by one mechanism, even if it's different organisms. They try to come up with some universal things because if they do a vaccine, they can't have a vaccine for every last thing that's in a tick. And it's for, you know, it's in every strain of every every uh, spirochete, in every babesia if it's tricky, and they try to find some common ground uh, on, on these kind of organisms to see if there's a way to treat. Because the original vaccine was only against one protein expressed in a tick, not expressed in a person. So the vaccine was outer surface protein A, and that um, didn't go so well. Thank you. So, I'd like to ask you about plasmapheresis as a possible treatment for Lyme. Well, there's a, there's a, um, a growing number, a bigger list, that's one of them, of how do you deal with the immune response? How do you do? Plasmapheresis is used for babesia sometimes. So if somebody has so many um, parasites in, their, in their, their blood, I don't typically arrange for it. I think that whatever I see plasmapheresis used most often is in a hospital setting when they're when someone's in a crisis and they don't know what to do, and they'll do you know the immune system is busy and they'll do it. So I don't personally um, use it, and so I don't think much is written on the subject. So. I don't know if that helps to answer the bigger part of your curious about. Well, I, for me, I had plasmapheresis when I was in the hospital, uh, and I was in a situation where I couldn't walk. Yeah. And it, I don't know if that, I also had lots of antibiotics, and it all seemed to work pretty well. Yeah, I think that that's a good example of, in the hospital setting, they show sure every tool they can think of during an acute setting with an immune response, and so, it probably hasn't been looked at enough to know what it was doing. And, and so there's a, it's an opportunity for further research on w w why is that value for some cases. And then all of these other kind of things like stem cell, for example, it's, uh, you know, I follow that pretty closely also. I and mean, it's hard to tell because there's such diversity in what stem cells are being used and how they're being used, how they're being processed. It's, and there's not much research on the subject because you can go to uh, Germany and get heated, heat therapy, so that you run into it with, with, with so many people with Lyme and so many people in trouble is that people hear about these things and they often have very ability you can actually do um, at the time. Um, you know, I, can, I can't guide people very well in, in what's actually, uh, what they're shooting for and those type of things. So I, I try to like, so many people get better with the fundamentals. I also try to make sure they don't eat sugar, drink alcohol, um, and, uh, and, and then counseling. 
those all those things help a great deal, but you know, people will often have alternative medicines. It seems logical. Yes, back there. Uh, well, ticks, I was wondering what you know what they carry. Well, I, I mentioned at the very beginning a deer tick, a dog deer tick is pretty good size. So a dog tick, a deer tick, a I mean, the dog deer tick and dog tick look similar in size. So I always tell people make sure that just because it's big, it was a dog tick. Dog tick tends to have kind of brownish tan shield behind the head. There are some organisms that um, that are similar to the lion. Um, but not about the same. Part of it has to do with uh, ticks are opportunistic, is that they will often pick up what's in the environment. So most of the problems around here are nymphs and adults from the spider feet, from the black lady tick, is that when you go down to Brazil and they find that they have the same line we have here there, but the ticks are quite different down there. And then the, the Lone Star chicks uh, have uh, their own set of infections. But I think part of it reflects what's the, what's the, what the meals are getting and who they're getting meals from. But, uh, I, I'm not an entomologist, so it's hard for me to keep track of everything. You know, and I do this all the time. Which things are which tick. Rocky Mountain Spot of Fever, of course, is, a, is one of them. But I, I don't trust that's the only thing in the dog. And I don't trust that when people say there's a big tick, but that's a, only a dog tick. And, and also the tick that we saw is not always the one that got it. Because it's not often, it's, it shows they've been around ticks, but it could be the other tick that they had in the bed with them, then the dog tick that they took off. Also a tick, uh, I find that if somebody gets a tick bite, then they start thinking of Lyme, but they already had Lyme already from something else. They, they blame the tick that got them as the issue. And so the tick reminds them to think about what their health is supposed to be like. Where, where were they? Where were they headed? Right. Um, Michelle has a question over here. Oh, I'm good. You answered it in one of the other questions. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. You're welcome. Okay. Producer question. Oh, you're here. You had mentioned no alcohol and no sugar. Are there any other dietary things that you recommend? And what is the role of nightshades? Well, there's a there's a, a lot of um, suggestions that the alternative medicine communities and patient communities uh, come in with uh, the gluten free, the dairy free. The, the, it just it's, it's I, I find that um, it's it's hard to keep track of all of those different diets, and so a lot of my patients already come in with the, with it. Like I had some adolescent this week that was at every diet you could think of. And she kind of kept peeling. Now she did something like they call elimination. She eliminated everything. And then, so eventually as she's getting better, she she's um, pretty much uh, back to normal now. But she didn't give up the gluten-free diet because she said, well, maybe that was the one uh, that uh, she might have hold on because she got that habit down. And uh, so it's hard to tell. I'm not a, I can't give much feedback on it. On, on who benefits from which diet. Because there's, there's some people that benefit from a very careful diet. But whatever diet you pick, I always want to tell them, make sure you stay away from simple sugars, processed sweets, and alcohol, because that's, uh, that I get clear benefits. Harder on the other ones to know, and so I'm not, that's what I'm going to ask. Can you give us an update on the vaccination? The vaccination is, um, died uh, after a year or two, uh, uh, maybe 15, 20 years ago. Um, it didn't have very many sales. Um, hardly anybody in the area was um, that excited about it because it could prevent rashes. They said it prevented mine, but it was only defined by preventing rashes. <coughs> so, and then there was a few people who said they thought they had pains after the vaccine. They thought it was an autoimmune type issue related. So whether that's true, I don't know. I, all I know is that um, I thought it would prevent the rashes. It wasn't as excited about it. So I, 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 whenever I would talk to a patient about it, I always said, well, it depends on your goal. But lately, they keep trying to bring that vaccine back, saying it was all a patient's fault. 
patients have to get the pellets, that they're the ones that complain about. And so since they voluntarily removed it from the market, can't they voluntarily <coughs> bring it back to the market? Maybe the next generation will like it. But it was only for the outer surface protein A of one strain of one spirochete. It had nothing to do with their lichia preventing it. Anaplasmosis, Babesia, Bartonella, Neomoti. And it wasn't against all the strains either. So it's not clear if they come up with a little vaccine that it's going to help. So you know, they, they certainly know a lot more about the immunology of it. So, but it's expensive to take 10,000 people through trials. So, um, you know, randomizing and all those kind of things. So it's, it's hard to tell. There's some research going and interest, but uh, I don't know how far it's going to go. And also, it's only going to prevent one type of issue. In our future, will there be a change like with the CDC and for training other providers and getting on board with doing what you're doing? The question is will, it, will there be any change in the foreseeable future? <laughs> will the CDC change? Um, well, that's why I was approaching it from uh, the one end of the, of the bell shaped curve is that not budging much. Um, but there's a lot of, there's a whole generation of younger doctors who I think would have probably done a little better job, but they're all joining the big groups because they have to financially they, to get the, to get cut coverage because they're broke, you know, they have student loans and so you don't see an independent new doctor coming in shifting the curve because these big groups that don't budge much. And so they need some groups to budge and, and, and change. But even if they do change, life is not easy anyway because they put it I told you today that even as much at 13 years I've worked with mine, it still can be challenging. Um, communicating, working with families, it's tough, uh, even, if, even if there's nobody like this in the way. Over here? Yeah, uh, talking about prevention, we all hear about doing a tick check and permethrin in your clothes and then suffering coma, things like that. Are, are you familiar with the use of sulfur, MSM? I didn't find much of it on the, on, I, I know one man who swears by it. I looked it up on the internet. There wasn't a lot of information, but I tried it last year, and I went down from taking dozens of ticks off me in the summer to two. So I'm on it again this year. Yeah, the, the question is, is that um, like things like, uh, are there any uh, other remedies? Like, like we had some suggest sulfur and MSM, MSM. Yeah. Yeah, and so uh, there's we have to do something because the case of Lyme keeps going up, even though the CDC every year says take heat, take uh, erythrum and your clothes, and do tick checks and take showers. And so we're not there's plenty of people getting bit even who take all of those precautions. So. Uh, even pyrethrin, there's a, one of the blogs I wrote was interesting on when you put that chemical, that toxic into flows. Uh, they took a pants leg and kind of stuck it up on here to let it take, crawl up the, uh, the cloth to see if it would die. And if, if, if it was on there, that pants leg for 10 seconds, it would fall off to a hot feet and maybe die eventually. But uh, if you figure out a way to get to your skin in less than 10 seconds, it could do fine. So that, or if it got to the skin in the first place, it was fine. So that would have to, so that would work in that case if you had pants leg long enough and the time it took to make sure it took its time getting up the pants leg. Uh, like tuck pants in the socks, that kind of thing, with the right kind of things. But it might not work if you have your, if you have the, your, your shorts on. It might not work very well. So it that shows you that some of the even, even deep you know, how work, how effective it is. It's certainly a recommendation, but how effective it is, it, it's great at preventing mosquitoes. And it, it, CDC says it is good, I, I guess not as how, you know, and there's patients who say, I do, or I love my deep, and I, I'm not sure, you know, I still don't trust all the data on the advantage sprays, so we could probably do better. There's a bunch of people who have their own cocktails of things that that they put on themselves, that they sell in the neighborhoods and try to figure out what to do. And some of them are probably going to be very promising. 
Yes. This sulfur that he's talking about, is that something you take internally or you put it on your skin? I take it internally. Okay. Three times a week, a little eighth of a teaspoon. But is that sulfur or, or is that a, a That's homeopathic dose? It's, a, it's, from what I understand, you can take the element sulfur powder, but I've yeah. been taking MSM, which I forget the chemical name. It sounds like it's gotta be poisonous. <laughs> But uh, it's just the organic form of salt. Right, so that's where you get into where the, that there's good ideas floating around, just that you don't know what to do with them because uh, who's gonna, which ones are going to take off and be study which ones are not. So that's why. I think we, oh, back here. I think we got, we're getting close to the end of the questions. So I just wanted to make sure we don't miss any and then we'll close down. Go ahead. Could you discuss the long-term impact that antibiotics can have on your body if you're taking them for a period of time, and like how you combat the adverse effects of that? Well, if you take probiotics, it certainly helps uh, some. If you take dioxide, then you should be careful with the sun, so you don't get a sunburn. Uh, I, sometimes I use my statin, which is an antifungal pill, to fight uh, that. So, but as you um, as you look at the at the side effects, most of the side effects on antibiotics are immediate, like sunburn, heartburn, if you take that side of the stomach, or diarrhea. The, the issues are generally, where is society going? Because the society would like to avoid antibiotics for, and save them for the next generation. So you run into this issue of what's, what's more important is that your health versus society's goals, and it gets tricky there. And then there's the unknown is, will, if you took the antibiotic for four months, would that have any consequences? So, so far, it seems people tolerate antibiotics a lot longer for acne, for example, for Lyme, than you think. But um, we're not seeing any long-term disease for an individual from antibiotics. What you run into is just the concept of, would taking antibiotics for long term, you know, for chickens, for people, and for Lyme patients. You know, chickens, cows, and Lyme patients, is that going to have some effect? You know, certainly, if you don't take antibiotics, people don't do very well you know, sometimes. Sometimes 30, 30, 30 days works great. So I don't think it's completely worked out. Just most of the scare stories that you hear are because we're trying to save antibiotics for the next generation. And that's important. But then you're trying to make the calculated decisions, these tough decisions about should I take more than 30 days of treatment? Should I take intravenous treatment? Should I, uh, because it's, uh, you know, generally avoid antibiotics, but is it worth the risk of taking antibiotics? And that divides families also sometimes. Sometimes one person's family is totally opposed, and then the other person's saying, well, when I'm so sick and I've been to 10 other doctors and I don't have any other treatments except for suppressing my immune system with, a, with um, so many biological medicines, like Remicade or Ember. And they're making these tough decisions about those, those uh, alternative treatments. Should I use steroids? Or should I use antibiotics? Or should I just live with what I got? Should I take ketamine for pain? Um, Will that take care of the issue? So there's a lot of tough choices for each patient and their families. The good question on that, uh, I have patients all the time asking that same question, is that where do I, where is that line about side effects, problems, complications, <coughs> and, uh, and value, risks and benefits, what they usually call it. I usually also call it shared decision making because it's ultimately Two people with the same fact, with the same illness, sometimes come up with different decisions. One will want to take something, the others will say, well, I think I'll live this way. I'll just stay this way, I'll work with what I got, and I'll just eat well, I'll take care of myself, but I, I, and I might have an antibiotic that might help me, but I, I personally don't want to take it, so they would choose not to. I think the problem is he's a young adult, and you know, the other providers say, you know, they tell you don't take antibiotics. Yeah. And that's what we're running against, so you just can't talk to them about it. <laughs> right, if, the, if, the, if you can't get your decision making going with your some doctors because they they already know that they're opposed to antibiotics for anybody more than 21 days, and so 
when you, as a patient, you're used to having a consensus now. And most doctors agree on most things most of the time for angina, for hypertension, for diabetes. And so no matter who you see, what website you go to, what your primary doctor is, there's not that much difference between my mother in Minnesota who's on Norvax and who just at the age of 89 just had a stitch in her heart um, in January. But those two things might very well have happened in, in New York where I am now. So that's why those things are common. With Lyme, you, can, you can't get a consensus. So among good doctors with great credentials, trained in great medical centers, and then they have these opposite opinions. And you're trying to figure out what to do. And that, that, that's very hard for a, when you're standing alone. You know, even with supportive family, you still feel like you're alone. Way in the back. What are your feelings about CBD oil for treatment? Well, I have a, the question is through the CBD oil for treatment. I have a, some patients who like CBD oil, I don't see any problem with it. Some of them, uh, it helps with symptom management, sometimes. That's what I was wondering, is it more for symptoms or for to eradicate? Well, sometimes the illness, it's more symptom driven. It might be, a, it might help um, solve some of the Things about it the most, so, and then some people like it. So it's a, you know, it's they're relatively new that it's getting more accepted, um, and so I think that it's probably going to be. Um, it just seems to have promise. I haven't seen that many you know, studies, but I have done a literature search on it. But it seems favorable to the few people that have used it. There's another question. Yes. So do you generally suggest a short term? Antibiotic to wait and see if the relapse happens, or do you suggest longer term? Well, I always suggest, the question is short term or long term right off the bat. Uh, what I always suggest is 30 day follow up. So they have 30 days of antibiotics to, and, and try to figure out what antibiotic to pick. And then and the follow up is where we make decisions on what specialists they've seen, should they, what response have they seen, what, and what is it worth the risk of going past 30 days. And, or should we change up antibiotics? So I do follow up, and then if I go past that, a lot of the follow up is, is it worth continuing? Or are you succeeding? If you're not succeeding, then there, there's more specialists involved than, than you would imagine, trying to come up with some answer. Because at that point, I don't care who gets them better. Mine may be what brought them through to me, but that there's a, I have to always work on is there another alternative answer that's reasonable? Yes. Is your sedimentation rate a good gauge to use if you get a lot of negative line tests? Is the sedimentation rate useful? I, I find it's not very helpful. It's hardly ever elevated. It's usually two or three or five. Once in a while you get one, you know, let's say sedimentation rate just means the two cells, the blood cells, at a certain amount, number of millimeters. So if you have 90 or 100, that's usually some other disease. Um, sometimes I'll get occasional elevation of 20, 25. Not, it's not uh, elevated very often. And if it is elevated, it goes away pretty quickly. But the higher it is, the more workup I get for other specialists. Did that answer the question? Yeah. Okay. Well, C reactive protein is a similar measure. That goes up really quick with almost any inflammation. That might go up faster, so it shoots up quicker. But the sedimentation rate doesn't budge up as fast. And the white count tends to be on the lower end. And most of these illnesses, they tend to be close to the right at the cutoff or right below the cutoff. Do you have any more questions? Any more questions? Oh, yes, yeah, sir. Yeah. If you remove the tip and, and you notice that there's uh, you know, a small amount of bleeding at that site, do you see a benefit in expensively cleaning that? and maybe applying peroxide or something like that? Well, the question is that if you see some blood that the tick's removed or right at the site, I, I'm not so sure you know, whether it helps. Uh, I tend to clean it anyway if, I, if they're with me. Uh, it tends to leave kind of a, a broken down tissue that's like two or three millimeters in diameter, sometimes a black area, brown area, purple area, that can be. So uh, uh, it doesn't really put hydrogen peroxide on it. Whether it actually keeps 
the organism from entering your body, I don't know. That one, I, I don't know. And uh, so, it, is there any indication that the the model is, is somehow ghostly? That you get more sort of number of bacteria, you know, trying to get symptoms. Well, the question is, is it more bacteria make a difference? Um, it it said that if you squeeze the tick, burn the tick, aggravate the tick, it will throw up and its emesis will create more bacteria in you. Now, where they got that number, where they got that information, or is it just sort of a, one of those facts that seems logical and whether they'd ever prove such a thing, it's hard to tell. Um, but they, I think it had to do with the infection stays in the mid gut. It then has to get from the middle mid gut up to the saliva glands and then up into you, and so it's it's more of like it sounds like a great fact. Um, I'm not sure um, whether to you know, the taking it off makes a difference. Now, usually the, the ticks have what they call the big gulp problem. They're working and getting and getting into you. How to cut it? How to how to keep it from uh, being destroyed? How to affect the confidence. So, just when it's got it down, then there's a big gulp. It's, the tick just goes woo, really big. So they call it a big gulp uh, thing. And so it's that transition, how many infections can get transmitted as it's trying to work its way into the skin, how it work its way into you. Is that they're still studying that mechanism. They're all, part of the reason they're studying that mechanism is that could they use that to disrupt the infection? So if you disrupt the tick biting you from doing its job by fighting the compound, fighting something else, could you prevent all tick infection by not having the tick effectively bite you, efficiently bite you, efficiently so that doing that kind of thing? So that's why there's some research on uh, so much on the saliva. Is there something you could do against the saliva of the tick that would help prevent Lyme because you can wet the saliva during its thing, like tick drool. If you could get an anti-tick drool type vaccine, would that help ticks? <laughs> So that's a dream, but that doesn't mean it's going to happen. Okay. Well, there's a question. I don't know what, what time do you think this is called? Do you still have time for questions? Yeah, okay, yeah you're fine. Go ahead. So, are you, um, if you're a doctor only will do the protocol on the hepatitis, then they either do the 10 to 21 days of doxycycline. The study we were opposed to was taking two pills. Oh, okay. Uh, because two pills doesn't seem logical. Right. And so I, I tend to use 21 to 30 days myself. Some people use 10. Okay. I like the reason I do 21 to 30 is that I get a chance to have them come back to see me. I get a chance to do a blood test. Uh, once you take that about for the um, um, for the tip though, it alters the test. So you may not get a positive test. So uh, they often don't get by the test in the tree. They even show that and have two doxycycline pills messes up the test. So then you know, so I feel I have these clinical judgment. If there's if they're doing well 21 days and they're feeling great, uh, I'm always concerned that could the media happen later, could another infection happen later, so I spend some time on what to look for, what's important. And so I know over the next uh, months or a year. I want that back if there's issues that come up. So I'll spend a little time in counseling and what's good for them. I don't like to just set regular ongoing treatments or ongoing uh, visits in those situations because then, um, you know, a lot of people, uh, they, would, they were never sick in the first place. It just took me 21 days and nothing ever happens and nothing will happen. So if you do the 21 days, do you recommend then going back for testing, like say a year later or a year later than that, or only for some I, I usually do it just now. I don't, you know. There are some doctors that test every year after, and I'm not sure. I tend to 
do more counseling so they know if they're ill, it should get seen rather than try to guess what it was. But there are some differences in doctors and it seemed logical then. There's no my answer for everything. Okay. Can we give Dr. Cameron a round of applause? Um, please, there's lots of information out there and bottles of water. Please help yourself on your way out. And thank you for coming.